Copyright Stanford University. All rights reserved. And uh, continue on, we have next um, Alan Young, who is the chief of cardiology, boss of Joe, I, and other cardiologists here at Stanford. And uh, he had initially trained at Harvard Medical School for his uh, medical degree, and again, another former stomping ground in my Mass General for the residency and um, his internship, and then subsequently went to Brigham Women's Hospital for his cardiology fellowship, and has certainly um, received numerous awards and honors, including Board of Trustees of Lee Kai Foundation and also Cardiovascular <gasps> Research Foundation in uh, South Korea, as well as being on the editorial board of the uh, Journal of the American College of Cardiology. and. Uh, Alan is quite impressive as a catheter interventionalist and works on um, numerous novel technologies for uh, percutaneous intervention. Thank you, Alan. Uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Sorry about the attire because this Tuesday is our percutaneous valve day. So anytime, maybe I have to go back to the cath lab. Um, I'd like to thank Joe for asking us to talk about uh, what has been going on in cardiovascular medicine, and I want to extend that to a little bit about the service line called Stanford Cardiovascular Health, because I think as Joe, Ron, and Steve has really illustrated very clearly is that there's more and more collaboration across all the division that we can really see it as one service, if you may, in, in terms of how we provide care to our you know, pediatric patient, the adult patient, as a continuum. Um, I'd like to also thank Tom Kutemus, I'm not sure whether he's here now, my section chief for providing me with a lot of information, but uh, because of time, I'm going to be just highlighting a uh, certain part of it because obviously the division is pretty big and uh, not likely I can touch on everything that everybody has achieved uh, in the last uh, few years using this or using the board, I think using this. So what I'd like to touch on um, is that uh, the agenda is really looking at the clinical side, um, looking at the clinical sections traditionally defined. And then how is it organized in the hospital? Because I think some of you may have heard about it, but some of you probably don't know about uh, this particular service line. Ron has uh, sort of highlighted a little bit of the quality side. Um, I wouldn't talk about quality metric too much because Ron has done a really a, a great uh, job in terms of summarizing and, and putting what all the work we've done in the last few years. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about a couple of initiatives that we have done uh, or we're starting in the last year just to highlight how we actually approach some of these issues and how do we solve uh, them uh, in, in terms of getting the right resources, the right people, and the right uh, uh, space, if you may, to uh, try to achieve that. We're gonna talk a little bit about research, about funding, about you know, a couple of highlights again. And then finally, uh, just a challenge uh, slide. So traditionally, as you know, in, in cardiology or in cardiovascular medicine across uh, academic centers, they are divided into sections like this, you know, electrophysiology, general cardiology, heart failure, heart transplant, interventional cardiology, non-invasive imaging, in that kind of nature. But as just in a few of the, all the speakers before, really shows that now we're not really dividing in that fashion because that's concentrated in cardiology. We're really working with our surgical colleagues, with our pediatric colleagues, is much more uh, cohesive fashion. So as uh, Joe has done a great job in terms of looking at CVI, looking at really working with all the departments, not just cardiovascular departments or divisions, uh, to look at basic science research. In cardiovascular health, uh, which is the service line name for, for what we are trying to, uh, to do, we have sort of primary members, which obviously are the CT surgery department led by Joe, Ron Dahlman in the um, Division of Vascular Surgery, and myself in CV and Medicine. We will also work with all our sort of other sort of associated members, if you may, uh, in the anesthesia uh, division, of CV anesthesia, in radiology, and also in pulmonary medicine. So you can see that we're trying to group that together, really focusing on one thing, is focusing on our patient and not really academic definition. So let's just to illustrate to you what we have been able to achieve in the last couple of years is really based on, without doing a good organization sort of uh, um, um, restructuring, I think we cannot really do a lot of things we want to do in the future. So this is really the primary step is to try to reorganize. So here, um, the structure of the cardiovascular health you can see is really we couple with our uh, senior vice president, uh, uh, Sridhar Sachadri, and he's really very helpful in terms of getting resources and getting solve some of the problems. Then we have quality, um, as Ron has really uh, illustrated, we have a business development person, we have a person that now we're looking at really what we call value stream, which is a term that we use to describe sort of lean processing, meaning that we want to look at it from the patient standpoint when it comes through the system from the beginning 
to when they uh, leave the hospital, including outpatient going home as one continuum, focusing on them rather than focusing on us. So that's really what we are trying to evolve our system next to, um, is really these value streams, and I'll define that a little bit more. Also looking at operations, again, good ideas, it doesn't work a, a single dime if you don't really be able to carry it out in an operationally efficient manner. And finally, financially has to be sound. So we have these uh, six um, advanced treatment centers, or maybe termed differently in going forward, it's really these value streams. Again, if you look at valve disorders, coronary artery disease, arrhythmia, heart transplant, heart failure, peripheral vascular disease, aortic disease, we're trying to get physicians, nurses, and so forth to be organized in one center and one uh, uh, sort of uh, area that's focusing on a patient. For example, using coronary artery disease as an example, it really doesn't matter whether the patient um, it, it gets a bypass surgery or get a, a PCI. From a patient's standpoint, they want the right treatment. So we want to count all the procedures of revascularization in the same fashion. So instead of counting, you know, traditionally interventional cardiologists always struggle together with uh, surgeons because they say, well, you know, we want to keep our volume up. We want to, you know, do as many PCI as possible. But in this system, we're trying to get, that, get away from that. It's really trying to count all those the same. So that really, again, focusing back on the patient. The patient wants to come to the system, get the right treatment, and not necessarily they don't care really whether it is PCI or bypass. So at the bottom is really the sort of the core services uh, in terms of what we deliver in the cath lab, the echo lab, in the inpatient and outpatient, and also the EP lab and also the vascular lab. And the bottom one is a little bit more unique. It's really what we call the global cardiac initiatives. And what we've been done, doing in the past is really taking an idea that may require both surgeons, cardiologists, and other resources to tie it together either as a clinic, as a center, as an initiative. And I'll illustrate that um, a little bit more uh, using one of the low, sort of newer examples. So in the past with Marfan Clinic, which obviously tied the cardiologists like uh, Dr. David Liang and with uh, our surgeon uh, Craig Miller to really work on a, a disease state. Now we're gonna add genetic counseling uh, in a more robust fashion to that particular clinic. Ron Wittalis has been leading the amyloid um, and cardio-oncological clinic working with our oncology colleagues. UN Ashley has really worked a, a, did a great job in doing the, the inherited cardiovascular diseases clinic, including hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the uh, uh, familial hypercholesterolemia clinic, and also the channelopathy clinic, and really addressing genetic basis of heart disease. Jennifer Trimmel um, has really done, a, again, a, a superb job in trying to organize uh, the, the study of sex differences. You will hear about this in the afternoon a bit further. Um, and looking at the clinical side, how can we do differently in taking care of our patients, especially women patients with heart disease? Uh, Steve talked about the gen adult congenital program already, which has been really a, a great success. And I'm going to talk about SAFI and mobile health in a bit more. So I'm not going to talk about uh, quality because uh, Ron has really done uh, a great job in leading this uh, quality council. And this is sort of, again, every month we go through all the metric which again, if you think about it, is that if you have a out bad outcome, typically involve multiple services. In the past, if you look at it in an isolated fashion, we always point our fingers towards each other. The surgeon will say, well, the cardiologist do a bad job, and we will say, well, the surgeon did a bad job. So it, clearly, everybody did a bad job in that situation. So we have to count it, account it in that fashion, and this is what the Quality Council does, meaning take it out of individual division, department, and put it on a context of how can we improve the outcome of that particular patient. We also look at uh, patient satisfaction. As you all know, now patients give feedback to us. So when they leave the, the clinic, they actually have questionnaires sent to them, and they evaluate us and tell us how satisfied they are with the services we provide, both as a clinic and as a physician. And they, they will set, basically send us whether they will recommend us uh, to their relatives or their friends. And this is what the Prescani uh, service metric um, has been providing us. And overall, for both medicine, cardiovascular medicine, the surgery clinic, as well as the vascular clinic, we have been always been uh, doing quite well. If you can see here up in the green here, that uh, the hospital target is uh, in 62nd percentile, been always up in the 90, 90th and 90, uh, you know, 99th percentile. So again, um, due to the great work of our faculty and our staff. So in valve disorder, for example, lead by Bill Fearon and uh, Mike Fishbein and Dr. Miller, in the last several years, we've really been t uh, taking one part of it in the percutaneous valve to a really, really quite a, uh, successful um, outcomes. For example, as you know, we, we have talked about this before, is that we can treat aortic stenosis now with a catheter that has a valve mounted on it. 
and uh, pretty much uh, every week we now do three to four of these cases uh, in the cath lab, each taking approximately uh, an hour to two hours, uh, and the patient will be extubated and basically hopefully sent home the next couple of days. Depends on their, you know, their morbidities and other things going on. So we have done um, 428 patients uh, to date, and really most of them are done through the lake now, it's called transfemoral approach. And um, smaller numbers and over time has decreased as the catheter gets smaller, uh, instead of the what we call 24 French, which is about eight millimeter or more, to now down to 18 French or six millimeter or less. And what is important is that you can see that there's a, a pretty big growth over time, uh, on sort of year to year, about a 30% growth. And basically adding on both what is um, approved valves and also we have several experimental valves which are smaller, better, and you can see how clinical research also drives some of the uh, clinical volume and outcome as well. So over time we can compare ourselves how we, do, how we did and you look at here um, based on some of the databases, Partner, Source, and Friends 2, which is sort of the international uh, database, we can see that our patient with the expected outcome, what we call STS, the Society of Thoracic Surgery, expected before the operation, they have a high 9% uh, chance of major uh, a problem or mortality, and our 30-day mortality, about half of that. So clearly, this technology, as well as what we've learned over time, has provided a great outcome for our patient. We also recently has done what we call a mitral clip procedure. So we are trying to fix mitral regurgitation, uh, whether they're degenerative, which obviously flail leaflets, prolapse leaflets, and functional, meaning that the annual is getting bigger because of heart failure, ventricular dilatation, and other reason, that we can actually put a clip percutaneously through a transeptal approach, um, obviously through the vein, so really there's very little um, risk in terms of uh, arterial damage and so forth. So this is a system, actually it was invented by one of the Stanford fellow, uh, Preston Gore, many years ago. And it's really a very elegant um, uh, sort of engineering system that has that's provided about, about 20 degrees of freedom, meaning that you can work, work around in different ways, turning the tip of this particular clip. You can see there's a couple of grippers is essentially trying to go and down the ventricle and clip on the valve and bring them together. So this is one of the trials that we're currently enrolling patients in, is trying to look at functional um, um, mitral regurgitation and have a control group. And these patients uh, with uh, um, significant mitral regurgitation would be randomized to that. So I'm just going to show you one quick one. This is a 54-year-old man that has ischemic cardiomyopathy and basically has a very severe mitral regurgitation with a depressed ventricular function. And doesn't have any coronary disease, has significant, uh, has very uh, sort of uh, uh, maximum medical therapy already. So here, again, showing uh, an echocardiogram showing the mitral uh, valve closing, and you can put on Doppler. So clearly, there's a lot of color, though if you haven't seen echo before, going backwards into the um, left atrium in this chamber. Usually, there should be no sort of these high uh, color of uh, yellow and, um, and red in this chamber. So this is a very severe mitral regurgitation. So what we did is that we go across the transeptal uh, in fashion, and then essentially put this clip. Uh, this is in an open position, so we close it and grab one side and then grab the other side, the posterior and anterior leaflet, and bring them together. So this is when the lip clip is still in, and mitral regurgitation significantly decreased already. This is after it's been released. So this patient's uh, MR is significantly less, and at one, um, and this is an interesting picture. You can see the clip is actually in the middle of the mitral valve. So this I call the alien view because it looks like two eyes of an alien looking at you. If you may, this is sort of the alien view in a cartoon fashion. This is called the L-Fury stitch from the surgical world, but this is now you know, basically replicated by putting a clip in the mitral valve. So at month, one month follow-up, his class three symptoms have now decreased to class one. Let me talk about uh, how do we actually initiate a new uh, sort of global initiative. So this is SATHI. This is the Stanford South Asian Translational Heart uh, Initiative um, started by uh, uh, Raj Dash uh, in the last uh, six months or so. Essentially, it's really trying to understand whether we can impact a lot of South Asian heart health. Um, I don't want to go through great details. Essentially, we know that in this group of po patient population, they have a very high risk of heart disease and really not quite understood why, that particularly why they have high uh, coronary disease risk. And the Framingham risk score really traditionally very much underestimate this group of patients. And there's really very little 
uh, randomized trials. So the, in, the thought is that can we provide different care and provide different uh, research uh, answers in this group of patients, and how do we actually achieve that? And in the Bay Area, we know that's a great population, about 300,000 South Asian um, working in the high-tech industry as well as in, in medicine and any other um, sort of uh, fields. So the idea is really have a structure and think about it, uh, creating this um, program, this center, is look at research, look at focused clinical approach, how can we provide something different from our community physicians, and how can we support it? So this is, again, showing that this is not unique at the same time, meaning that if the, the El Camino Hospital, the PEMF, has something similar, but obviously Stanford, the SATI program, we want to provide something different. So this is what we uh, terms in terms of some translational research, some of the ability to look at genetic profiling and imaging. So again, so this is really comparing our uh, community that we want to provide something unique and different at Stanford. And this actually takes a while to really build up this particular capability so that we can actually offer this to our community. So again, even though we have an idea, we may have the idea how to carry it out, we need people. And for the last recent ye a few years, we really now have a, a group of, of physicians that are particularly interested in this area. So these are, again, a group of uh, almost uh, you know, 12 physicians that have particular interest in this particular field. And again, these are um, particular areas that we thought we can address first in 2014 and 15. So that's an idea. We have people, and now we need resources. So we come up with a budget, for example, how we can actually fund this in terms of getting some data analysis, uh, help in terms of some uh, research coordinator help to start, and also um, in terms of some uh, dollars to do some phenotyping and genotyping. So again, we're trying to come up with some dollars projection and we need some seed funding. So this is basically what we go to the hospital for because of what CVH can carry through to ask for some seed funding. Hopefully, they'll come through and be able to get this whole thing started. But there's still not enough. So again, as I would outline to you that for a lot of things that we do, we need to resources here. So we can see that we have $500,000 potentially for seed funding. We're gonna get right grants, obviously, and hopefully more, um, you know, even more than 1.5 million. But we're seeking, for example, philanthropy of about four million to get this uh, center endowed and be able to carry out the research we want to do. So I just want to use this as an example of how we actually think through a process, not just an idea, but if you have an idea but don't carry it out in, in a sort of systematic fashion, getting resources, you cannot really do anything we want to do. I want to touch quickly on the mobile health. We have talked about this in the past. This is an initiative that we're trying to do for our patients called Cardinal Commitment. Essentially, for any patient coming through that they have heart disease, we basically committed to prevent them from having, having any more uh, events uh, beyond um, the first one. So using coronary artery disease as an example, they, think they can come into the system with a, with a ST elevation MI, with chest pain, with risk factors, or with the just, you know, want to be screened. So we want to provide them with the best care based on obviously best uh, sort of the, the sort of multidisciplinary team approach. We also want to use the cutting edge technologies and also adding some genetic profiling. But we want uh, to do this uh, using also nowadays newer technology using basically um, mobile health technology to be able to track a lot of these patients biometric, and we'll come back to talk about that a little bit more, and also be able to have web presence for us to really be able to communicate with our patients. Because as you know, patients come back to the system rarely, uh, once every six months. In between, there's really no care. We don't know what happened to them. They'll come back typically, as you said, you know, they come back, they're exercising, they're eating well, and they listen to everything they, you, you tell them to do, but they gain 20 pounds. So, you know, I usually tell them um, that, you know, we should clone them because they basically will solve the energy problem of the world because they basically suck energy from the air and create mass is the reverse. But obviously, most of the time, it's that we don't know what to tell them. They don't know what happened to themselves. So we want to really provide now technology to help them um, figure out how to improve their own health. Research, uh, sponsor research, uh, this is just looking at cardiovascular medicine alone. Um, uh, in 2013, a, a big jump because of Joe Wu, our CVI Joe Wu, has uh, really sort of added a lot of the uh, funding and uh, has been a little downturn FY 2014, but we expect FY15 to be substantially better. I'm not going to go through a lot of the uh, research efforts. This is really a list of uh, showing all our faculty are all uh, pretty much engaged in many different areas, uh, ranging from arrhythmias to heart failures to um, obviously prevention and uh, outcome research. I'll just highlight a couple. 
So in arrhythmia section, as really you can see that um, they are looking at both enrolling clinical studies and looking at data analysis in multiple fields, you know, in uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, in terms of looking at some kind of cutting edge technology, looking at outcome studies, looking at some, you know, nagging problem, you know, you can ablate atrial fibrillation, but many of them have persistent atrial fibrillation as well. What do you do with them? Ventricular tachycardia, difficult problem. Again, how do we actually tackle that? And obviously, device and imaging. Um, an area that you and Ashley has been leading is really trying to lead a hospital effort to bank DNA to look at how uh, genetic research um, can uh, evolve uh, you know, the field of uh, personalized medicine. This is with uh, Mike Schneider as well. And it's really trying to start this process in recruiting 3,000 patients within the Stanford system to try to understand better the risk, at risk of developing human disease and how likely certain type of treatment will be helpful and whether certain type of treatment will be harmful. I think that's important. And also embedded in this is some of the, um, what we call cardinal commitment concept. It's really using micro, um, mobile health to try to better phenotype these patients and also feed back to them eventually to help them improve their care. So we have started a program um, specifically interested in, uh, in mobile health led by Mike McConnell is trying to look at population-based um, mobile health. This is not just patient. This is really studying the, everybody in the world that is interested in cardiovascular health and trying to understand what drives them to have better outcome. And exercise could be one of those factors. So we are basically trying to leverage um, mobile health technology, big data analysis, as well as behavioral changes to try to really, we can see how we can change the outcome of these patients. So this is something we'll be launching um, hopefully early next year. Um, with Ken McAfee and um, Bob Harrington, we are um, obviously in, in the midst of starting a Google baseline study, and this is a collaboration between Google, Duke, and Stanford. Um, and also, this is obviously helped by with our faculty, uh, David uh, Marin, as well. With basically studying about 5,000 coronary disease patients, 5,000 cancer patients, and really looking at uh, free strata, low risk, high risk, and established disease, trying to understand everything about this patient. So again, genetics, uh, phenotyping, imaging, and biospecimens really trying to look at long-term outcome. Can we understand the disease state to the fullest? This is, again, the team, the team is, uh, is uh, top-notch, obviously, both uh, uh, at Stanford. This is a Stanford team, and uh, we are a, a, a sort of complementary Duke team as well. And recently, um, Kieran Kush has uh, uh, really successfully put together an R01 that's really, I think, it's very uh, sort of an important and impressive one. As you know, that uh, organ donation, especially heart, is limited uh, a lot of times is that the donor's heart is never used, uh, but we don't know why. Um, so, for example, uh, uh, a lot of them are felt to be too sick, not good enough, but it's very variable between different um, uh, centers, different organ uh, procurement centers. So she wants to study basically 5,000 potential organ donors over five years and basically in-depth studying what are the don donor characteristics and what are, what are the reasons that they got accepted for heart um, and uh, transplant and why, why they uh, sort of rejected as a donor heart. And again, she would be uh, doing a statistical modeling to uh, out study some of these outcomes. And I think this is really an important area because you know, if we can use even 20% more of these hearts, they would obviously solve a lot of problems of organ shortage. I want to talk about space uh, very quickly because I think you know, without um, this, be able to have space to accommodate basic research, clinical research, as well as clinical care, we're going to be stuck. Um, so again, um, as you know, we have a new hospital coming up. This is the 500 passenger drive in the second floor. Hopefully, will be a lot of um, uh, cardiovascular presence. Will be um, both this, hopefully, the um, CVICU, the operating rooms, the uh, hybrid labs, the cath labs, as well as the imaging lab over there, and basically connected by this bridge back to the 300P, the current hospital. We're also trying to update our clinic. Um, right now, we're on the second floor of the Boswell building. We uh, plan to hopefully um, be able to occupy the third floor of the, of the um, Boswell as well to expand our uh, clinical footprint because we just don't have enough space for seeing our outpatient. Right now, we spread through over to uh, Blake Wilbur as well. We're going to update our um, echo lab because our echo lab, again, is uh, probably is, is vintage of 1960 rooms. And I think hopefully we can get this space basically modernized to be able to accommodate the need of our patient in a non-invasive uh, uh, laboratory. 
We recently opened up this uh, new building. Not sure all of you have been to the back side of the hospital, meaning the Welsh Road. This is the Asian Liver Center or the CJ Huang building. Um, this in it has a, a large uh, footprint for uh, medicine and uh, Bob generosity. We have a few of the, our faculty will be, um, especially EP uh, research will be uh, present over there. But clearly with the uh, re um, recruitment of fair number of faculty in, um, coming through, we have a, a problem, meaning that there's not really enough space. So really our challenges are really quite simple. Three, all three are space. There's not enough space for carrying out the work that we want to do. So the first one may be helped a little bit by the new hospital because we have more um, cath lab space, more um, OR, more um, ICU space. The second one is that uh, even with the expansion to the Boswell third floor, I think that building has to come down eventually because of seismically it is actually the most dangerous building in the hospital, right, in, the, in the campus right now. So you know my office is in that, in that section. So when an earthquake struck, I need to know exactly where to jump out and, uh, and so forth. Turn, turn right and jump three feet, I think. So that's the Boswell building. So that's the question is whether we can have a new sort of clinic building over there. And finally, as uh, um, Joe Boo knows that we're gonna try to raise funds for a bio innovation building that will have CVI um, presence in it, probably maybe one to two floors, depends on how, uh, how it's finally structured. But um, all of that probably will be in, in the 2020 range because the new hospital has to be finished first before we can do anything else. So obviously, all of that needs uh, philanthropy, and that's really uh, an important um, drive we have right now together with the dean's office is really trying to um, raise funds to try to achieve some of these limitations and allow us to expand um, to really what we want to do both in clinical care, um, in clinical research, as well as basic research. Thank you very much. Okay. Great. Thank you, Alan, for that wonderful... Copyright Stanford University, all rights reserved.